Thank you, Amy. So our first speaker is Dr. Dieter Hoens. So uh, Dr. Hoens is a professor for experimental physics at University of Hamburg since 2007, sharing his time between experimental dark matter searches and the gamma ray astronomy with Fermi Light, Heiss, Tiger, and CTA. He is an assistant professor at the uh, University of Tübingen in the actual group of uh, uh, Dr. San Santa Gallo between 2004 and 2007, working on integral x man and the symbol X. He is a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute, Hedberg between uh, 2001 and 2004. Uh, with contribution to the uh, HEGRA and HES and the IR Cherenkov telescopes. Dr. Hans has uh, his PhD at University of Hamburg in 2000 on uh, air power detection for gravity astronomy and uh, uh, HEGRA. So today, Dr. Hans will tell us about the magnetic field in the Corral Nebula. So please take it away. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to present some results that we've published recently in this uh, preprint that you see here. And uh, this work was done together with uh, two PhD students, or former PhD students of mine, which in the meantime have moved on. So the topic of today's talk is the magnetic field in the Crab Nebula. And just to give you a little bit of uh, astrophysics folklore about this object, as you probably know it anyway, just a few um, maybe uh, main points to keep in mind. So the distance of this object is two kiloparsecs. There's been some new numbers floating around recently, which have pushed the distance uh, more uh, to, to like three or even four kiloparsecs, which is hard to believe. But I'll stick here for the purpose of this talk with the two kiloparsecs, which is sort of the canonical value. The progenitor star of this supernova remnant is approximately um, 10 solar masses. Um, at least as a lower limit, it could be a little bit more massive, but in the ballpark of sort of 10, maybe 12 solar masses. And uh, it's been really an object which has been observed in uh, basically by every single instrument that I'm aware of, uh, because it's, it's uh, become, uh, or it's, it's more like a standard candle in most cases and not so much studied for the physics behind the object, but for the benefit of its uh, rather constant flux and, and also broadband spectral energy distribution, which makes it observable every wavelength band that's accessible. Um, it's been also studied theoretically uh, for, um, I would say about 60 years. Uh, so starting with some studies of Piddington and then Kardashev. But the main uh, papers, which I just wanna highlight here already is this paper by Reese and Garden from 74, where the idea was introduced that this object is a, uh, well, the, the nebula is powered by a uh, wind, which is coming from the pulsar in the center. And this wind is then uh, terminating in a termination shock, and that basically then uh, leads to this expanding nebula. This model is really the standard paradigm for um, basically all parts of a nebula that, that we look at today. And it has been refined in the 80s by Kenneth Corniti in a series of papers, the 1984 paper, maybe to mention as the most important one, because there the discussion is about what kind of properties this wind has in a bit more detail. But we'll get back to this model in a moment. Now, what is striking about this source, which is known for such a long time, is that in the past decade, there have been really uh, kind of surprises uh, in observations, mainly driven at the gamma rays, but also in X-rays, because um, in 2011, uh, it became clear that the presumably constant X-ray flux actually varies by a few percent uh, in a secular way. So a few years goes up and a few years it goes down. And more dramatically, at about the same time, uh, it became clear by observations with the Agile and Fermilat that there's uh, frequent flares. So the source basically flares and goes away like a factor of five to 10 higher fluxes at MEV. And that was really a surprise because this hadn't been uh, expected. And uh, it's still unique in a sense that we haven't observed similar things from any other parts of a nebula. We also found, and this came a little later because it's a more subtle effect, but I find still even more dramatic that the MEV, 100 MeV flux of this object can turn off basically completely within a few days to recover after a few days. We called that fast dimming and we discovered that a couple of years ago it had been also confirmed by other groups uh, by observations with family labs. 
And this has very severe consequences because the idea that this is like a steady source, which basically has some flares you know, coming from somewhere in the nebula occasionally, has to be uh, changed and has to be adapted because if something dims and turns off, it needs to be the whole emission has to become from a very compact region which is kind of dramatic because then the nebula isn't this big multiple parsec, uh, multiple parsec large object. But at MEV energies, we look at an object which has a uh, light crossing size of a few light days. We also found that the object at the uh, gamma ray emission or the gamma ray regime between a few GeV and a few TeV changes its uh, size, so it shrinks, which is sort of expected. And just recently, um, the LASO collaboration announced that they found PV photons, two of them, in their initial observations. So that's another sort of surprise because this was not completely expected. So um, coming back to this original idea of the parts of a nebula that was put forward by Kennel Coroniti. So, so the idea is sort of captured in the sketch that you see on the left. So the pulsar in the center basically produces a wind and that wind is uh, presumably going pretty much isotropically, and it's ultra relativistic. So it's a wind which has a Lorentz factor of uh, 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7. It's not completely clear where it is, but it's sort of emanating a wind of electrons and positrons coming out of this object. And that wind will terminate at some point when the shocks, uh, when, the, when the pressure balance is, is uh, with the ambient medium reached. And this termination shock has a distance of about uh, 0.1 parsecs or about 10 to 14 arc seconds from the center of the object. Since the wind is cold so that the particles when you put yourself in the rest frame basically just flows out without any uh, te temperature, uh, it doesn't cross any magnetic field line, so it becomes, it's dark. That's what we can also observe in the X-rays. There's a region within uh, the first 10 arc seconds which was resolved with Chandra where there's essentially no or very little X-ray emission present. And then beyond the shock, the wind slows down. And this is, depends upon the properties of the shock. So if this is a strong hydrodynamic shock, uh, the, the flow uh, can slow down considerably and may, keeps on slow, slowing down when you move further away from this hydrodynamic shock. And this way, then you can actually reach this velocity at about 1,500 kilometers of second, per second, which we measure as the expansion velocity of the, of the nebula. And so the Kennel Coroniti paper essentially states you have to have a hydrodynamic shock. That means that the pressure and magnetic field is very low. As a matter of fact, it only carries about 0.3% of the total pressure with it. And so the wind is a kinetic energy dominated. So all the energy is in the, in the bulk motion of the flow. And otherwise you cannot match the outer boundary. So that was a long, long standing paradigm that the, the wind has to be basically um, uh, very, very weak in terms of its magnetization or magnetic energy density. So this so-called sigma parameter, which is given here, captures this uh, fraction of energy in the, in the magnetic field with respect to the kinetic energy of the bulk flow with the Lorentz factor gamma. And so the canonical value which comes out of this analysis is sigma to be 0 0.003, so 0.3% of the energy density of the luminosity goes out in magnetic field, the rest is in kinetic energy. So 99.7% is in kinetic energy. However, if sigma is larger, you basically uh, become more like a magnetohydrodynamic shock, but then the flow speed is too high to match this, uh, this outer uh, expansion velocity. Another consequence of this is since the wind slows down and magnetic flux is conserved, uh, unless you dissipate magnetic fields, it means that also the magnetic, um, uh, the magnetic field or the flux density has to increase with increasing distance because the, the, the flow slows down. So basically this toroidal, large scale toroidal field uh, is being increased and the B field goes up with increasing distance. So that is sort of the standard picture uh, that, that we've been following for the past roughly 50 years because that was the initial idea from recent gun. Here's some details of this calculation. This is original from the Kennel Coroniti paper. Here you see the flow velocity. This is where the termination shock is. This is 10 termination shock radii distance, 100. So that would be roughly the nebula size. And you see that depending on the value of the sigma, you basically have a decrease in the flow velocity. And then you reach a th terminal velocity, which is finite as a matter of fact. And that's a consequence of flux preservation of the magnetic field. Magnetic field goes up if you have a small magnetization, so sigma 0.01 or smaller, it basically increases with the radius and then it starts dropping essentially because of the boundary conditions. 
And this worked fine. You know, and I mean, if you have poor data, this kind of model works very, very nice. And this was the situation in the 1936 paper that was put forward by Aronian and Atoyan, where they looked at the broadband energy distribution of the crab uh, from the radio to the gamma rays. That was the time when there was the first sort of batch of data coming out with the gamma ray observations from the nebula uh, by the time by the gamma ray observatory and the egret instrument and some ground-based rank of telescopes like Whipple, Hegra, and so on and so forth. So the, the situation was such that you had a broad synchrotron bump. You had a component which was very hard, and this is the so-called radio um, electrons, presumably producing synchrotron emission. And then in the X-ray, you had a nice power loss spectrum going from soft X-rays to hard X-rays with some indications of softening uh, until you hit the end point of the synchrotron spectrum and indicated here is the electron energy which is responsible for this emission. So you need electrons from few GeV up to PeV energies to explain the synchrotron emission. And then if you take this value of sigma and you consistently calculate um, the, the inverse Compton emission, um, you basically immediately get a very nice fit. So this dashed line here sort of traces the gamma ray spectra and has the right uh, flux as well as the right shape uh, given the data's accuracy at the time. So we continued with this kind of modeling. Uh, we picked it up several, uh, you know, 15 years later or so. And uh, we looked into this kind of um, model in, in the same way, now with more improved data. At the time, already Fermi Lat was observing the source. Um, otherwise, in the radio, the optical X-ray, the sort of situation hadn't changed a whole lot. But you see that the error bars over here have become much, much smaller. So if you compare this with this picture here, you see that the error bars become much smaller. And we found, well, we did a real chi-square fit to the data. We tried to optimize the parameters. And uh, we found that the inverse Compton spectrum sort of works. But you see here that in the uh, ground-based um, spectra, they are, they are much they are softer um, than the blue line would predict. And so on the chi-square, you can also see how goodness of fit is. And the goodness of fit is not really convincing. It sort of is not exactly as we want it to be, close to unity. But we are sort of well beyond that. So there's some tension that was building up. And we tried a simple other model, which is essentially saying, oh, let's try just a constant B field. And that actually fit better. So if you look at the same kind of modeling, uh, B field is constant. We fix the value, which is 124 microgauss. Uh, we get a much improved fit. And you also see that uh, the inverse Compton spectrum actually looks uh, much more consistent here with the data. Chi-square looks better, so everything looked neat. Uh, however, constant B field is not what you'd expect already in this uh, kennel coronity type model. So if you compare this, uh, so this is the B field as a function of the radius. Our constant B field model at the time would give us a best fitting value of 124 microgauss with some uncertainty indicated by the yellow band. And the uh, kennel coronity type model would give us a B field that would increase as expected and then sort of turns down gradually at larger distance. Now, this is a plot that, that takes a little staring at to, to get behind it because there's some additional information which is folded in here. You see the dashed lines or dashed dotted lines. Dashed dotted lines indicate you where the inverse Compton emission comes from. So the, the 1 GV, 100 GV inverse Compton emission is presumably produced throughout the whole nebula. So that sees a certain magnetic field in that volume. Whereas the 10 TeV emission and on TV and 10 TV emission is mainly produced closer to the termination shock. And if you look back at how inverse Compton radiation scales with B field, um, it scales uh, with the B field in a way that the synchrotron emission basically is proportional to the energy density of the magnetic field and the number of electrons you've got. The inverse Compton is proportional to the energy density of the seed photon field and the number of electrons you've got. So if you take the ratio of the two, the electrons cancel out, and then you basically see the ratio of seed photon field density to energy density of the B field. So if you look at the 10 TeV uh, electron or 10 TeV emitting part of the electrons, they basically live close to the termination shock, closer to the termination shock where the kennel coronity field drops. So in order to get the same synchrotron emission, you would need more electrons. And that, of course, increases then the amount of inverse Compton emission at this high energy end. So that makes the spectrum become harder if you have a rising B field. Conversely, if the B field is constant or even drops, you get a softer spectrum. 
And that's telling you already that to, in order to study the magnetic field, you need the inverse Compton emission. That's the lesson one we take away from this. The second thing is we can actually try to reconstruct the magnetic field by looking carefully at the energy spectrum at multiple TV in the whole multi-wavelength picture, of course. So that's what we did in this last recent paper. So we plug in uh, essentially some kind of prescription for the electrons. So we have the radio electrons and radio electrons must be spatially distributed. And we therefore have a model for the density as a function of radius. So everything is spherically symmetric to make life easy, but at least tractable because otherwise it gets really difficult to do computing, computing wise. And then we have a power law spectrum. So this is the Lorentz factor of the electrons that lives between some lower and upper bound of the Lorentz factor. And then the electrons have a spatial distribution, which is just a radial Gaussian. So there's a free parameter here, which is the uh, rho r, which tells you how quickly they drop off with increasing radius. So in our model, we basically treat as free parameters, the spectral index sr. We treat as a free parameter, the normalizations, that is the number of electrons which exist. That's the nr, the prefactor here. We have a free parameter, which is the upper bound of the uh, spectrum, and we have this spatial size in the radio electrons. And you see already here, these are the fit parameters that we get out of the fit with the uncertainties. Very small uncertainties, for example, on the power law index. We get a number of electrons, which is 10 to the 51. It's another problem to deal with because the number is quite large, but that's consistently whenever you look at the radio emission from the crab, but this is not today's topic. And we find an overall energy in radio electrons when you integrate that up of three times 10 to the 47 ergs. Spatial size is 89 arc seconds. So that's the Gaussian size that you need. Then we have the wind electrons. This is then responsible for the optical to X-ray emission. And that's more complicated. Bottom line is it's a broken power law that we stick in here that looks in this equation a little bit more complicated because we just wanna have here some spectral indices S1, S2 and S3. And we have some break uh, Lorentz factors uh, gamma W1, gamma W2, and gamma W3 is then the endpoint. Uh, and the main difference to the radio electrons besides the spectral shape is also that we allow the size of the spatial distribution of the electrons to vary with the energy of the electrons. So we have a power law here so that this row parameter is now dependent on the Lorentz factor and it goes with gamma to the minus beta. So it drops off, so it becomes more compact with increasing energy, sort of to model the effect of radiative cooling losses. And then you get, uh, for a full description of this thing, you've got now these parameters, uh, Psi 5 to Psi 14, so it's 10 parameters. And here are the fit parameters that we get out, so we can determine all of them in this fit, because there's lots of data that we fit to that you saw already before. Just to give you some idea, so this wind electrons, they start at about 200 GeV, they have a break at 3 TeV and 100 TeV, and they end at the highest energy of 2.5 PeV. And again, wind electrons have about, about the same energy total as the uh, radio electrons. And interestingly also, the spatial distribution of the wind electrons extends a little bit further than the radio electrons, which is a bit counterintuitive if you think about cooling processes. So that tells you already that there's probably, in addition to energy independent convective motion, there must be also an energy dependent like diffusive transport involved in this whole thing. Now, the, uh, this is then in a picture, the same story. This is the electron distribution now looked at different distances to the pulsar. So 0.114 parsec is right at the termination shock. And then you see the, the electron density dropping off with increasing distance. And you see also that the shape of the electron spectrum looks essentially similar to what you would expect in terms of radiative cooling. And then the volume average is then this, uh, uh, this, this uh, sort of brownish line here. Now these electrons emit, so we have to model the emissivities, and the emissivities include circuitron inverse Compton, and there's the computing difficult part. This inverse Compton emission will upscatter the seed photons which are produced by the synchrotron. In order to do everything consistently, you'd have to then calculate this whole thing and integrate over the whole volume to get the seed photon density here. So that makes it a bit tr tricky to do, but it, it works in the end fine. Now here's the seed energy density then uh, overlaid on the picture. So you see that the dust has a sort of, sort of interesting feature, which we'll look at in a moment. CMB is constant as a function of distance. And here's the, uh, the, uh, the wind synchrotron emission energy density. This is a logarithmic scale. And this is the radio synchrotron uh, energy density, which goes into the inverse Compton. Uh, 
about the dust, this is an issue which is not so easy to deal with because the dust is um, uh, distributed in a different way than the electrons. Uh, the dust is uh, only heated in a, in a sort of a shell structure which um, surrounds the, the uh, electron nebula. And so we treat the dust here as a two temperature dust population where we leave the temperatures free parameters and we put in a physical model for the dust uh, grains. So we have assuming that they're amorphous carbon grains and they have a specific uh, range of, of uh, radii between 10 to the minus three to 10 to the minus one micrometers. This is uh, fixed. This is a sort of taken from what people use uh, as realistic scenarios for the dust production in, in this uh, object like this. And we fit here the total dust amount and the temperature of the two dust uh, uh, populations. So we find a hot population at 150 Kelvin plus minus eight and a colder one at 39. That one dominates in terms of the mass because this is about 10 to the minus you know, 0.1 solar masses of dust. And that pushes actually a little bit the efficiency with which dust grains have to form in order to match this. What we ignore completely is the thermal plasma. So you also have the optical uh, lines, for example, and also the, the dust uh, uh, or the dusty plasma excitation that you also see in terms of lines. This we all leave out. Uh, it contributes additional seed photons, which we ignore at this point. But this is at a few percent level, so I think that's fine. Uh, we also ignore the presence of relativistic nuclei, which would be interesting, but we cannot uh, know about them unless they are needed, then we can put them in, of course. And we also do not consider the variability. So this is like a steady state snapshot type um, model. So here are the results. Just quickly, a few of the uh, highlights. So in the optical and the infrared, we get here now the data, uh, the blue points that are in the fit. And then you see this is the synchrotron emission from the radio, which killed, which dies off because this is the end of the synchrotron spectrum coming from the electron spectrum that we put in. And then essentially the dust takes over. And these are the two bumps, which you see, this is the colder dust component. That's the warmer dust component. This is the 40, this is the 150 K. And it fits very nicely to data. But mind you, since the radio turns down in order to get this transition right, we actually have a substantial uh, larger amount of dust than in previous modeling, where you usually fit just a, a line through these and you interpolate and then you just need less dust. The optical is a bit tricky because you have to you take the extinction into account. And here we see the observed flux points and these are the flux points which go into the fit. And we use a particular uh, more recent updated um, reddening um, law that has that been reconstructed uh, towards the crab. In the X-ray, this is actually a tricky part because there's lots of X-ray observations and they do not mutually agree very well, even though there's been, of course, substantial effort to cross calibrate instruments with the X-ray observations. And we used to use the XMMPN data because that was supposed to be calibrated with first principle. But as it turns out, uh, it's not consistent with the more recent uh, data from USTAR, where you'd use the stray light observations to do an absolute flux calibration without taking into account the X-ray optics. So, so we, we sort of normalize everything to the new star, which means that we have to upscale our previous value from the XMMPN because that's about 15% lower. Uh, this, however, gives us a quite nice overall uh, uh, shape here. So there's a break, which is about 100 to 200 kV. Uh, and then, however, there's a little bit of an issue with the COMTEL data, uh, because that seems to be harder than expected when you look at the extrapolation. And also, we had to upscale that already here by, 50, by 30% to keep it at least somehow in line with what we were seeing here. So this is really a tricky part overall. Here's some uh, results of this kind of fit just looking at the angular extension now. Uh, so this is the angular extension in arc seconds uh, defined as a 68 percentile in which you know the whole uh, uh, flux is, is confined to as a function of uh, energy or frequency here it's uh, plotted. So that's the 550 gigahertz points. These are data from WISE and from Spitzer and from, from Herschel. And then this is uh, data from uh, XMM uh, Newton, uh, the, the UV monitor. And then this is Chandra data in the X-ray. And you see nicely, you get this sort of overlaid uh, extension in the transition from the X, from the radio to the optical and the infrared nicely with, the, with our uh, model. It's a little bit you know, bump, more bumpy in the data than we can fit it here. But I think the tendency is quite nicely shown here. So there's actually some, some work to be done. But for, for the purpose of the magnetic field structure, this doesn't have much influence. So then you see this, this drop off with increasing frequency. And then at the inverse Compton, this is also new. We also have data now here, which we have to fit. These are extension data from Fermi LUT. And then over here, we've got one flux point or one size point that is measured with, with HESS. Uh, 
as a cross check. We look also at the optical spectra as a function of radius from data from Perron, City, and Voltia from 93. And then you see nicely, we also, this is the blue curve is the model curve, the orange points is from the data, and we also can give this, even though this didn't go into the fit. And now this is really the sort of uh, main plot that I want to highlight. You can basically fit the synchrotron with whatever B field you choose. You can choose an arbitrary normalization for the B field at the termination shock. That's the model we put in. And we assume now this goes like with some power law, uh, R over RS to the power of minus alpha. So it can actually go down and can go up. But we basically have alpha to be fit to be positive. So it decreases with increasing radius. So whatever you choose here for alpha, color coded here, alpha goes between zero and one. Zero would be a constant B field model and one would be dropping with R to the minus one. The synchrotron you can fit all the curves are overlaid here. You see just one curve here. You see a little bit of colors peeking through here, but essentially you can fit whatever you like in the synchrotron part. It doesn't matter. You're not sensitive at all to, to the shape of the B field. You can do whatever you like, and you can also choose the normalization freely, of course. Once you use the inverse Compton, you break the degeneracy, and that's important. So you can fix then the B0, and you can also fix the alpha. And you see nicely here the inverse Compton spectrum. You see this very soft spectrum when the B drops quickly, as I was explaining before and it remains rather hard when the B is constant. And now you basically just have to put the data points on top and then you know how the B field behaves. And that's what I wanna show you here. So this is what we looked at before. And here's the data now uh, that we uh, compiled and you see very nicely, Fermilat data sort of is not really distinct, in, not so easy to distinguish between the values of alpha, but in the very high energy regime between uh, above the beyond the peak, beyond about hundred uh, JGEV, to now almost PV energies, the data points really pick out a particular shape of the B field in order to match the spectral shape. So essentially you should look at the spectral shape in the, uh, in the, in the VHE regime above TEV energies, you get the alpha and you know then what the B field looks like. And so we fit this value to be about 0.5. Also the extension can be fit in this model. And also again, you see the extension favors a value sort of in the greenish, 0.5 is about right here. Even though here the uncertainties are so big that mainly uh, this, this value of alpha is determined by the spectrum and not so much by the extension. And this is the grand overall picture just to uh, demonstrate that we can actually fit the whole thing from the radio to 100 uh, to PEV energies with this model. And the goodness of fit, you can see it here is actually quite good. You see here the individual components. So that's the synchrotron component, the SED, the extension, uh, the inverse Compton ex uh, SED, the inverse Compton extension, and also the VHE uh, data. So that's then the data which comes in over here. This is the chi-square, this is the degree of freedom. It's all a beautiful fit. And um, we can say that this model works and it gives us a very accurate uh, um, sort of um, set of parameters which describes the whole setup. For the VHE data, we do a little bit of cheating in a sense that we allow for some little rescaling of the energy scale. Keep in mind, these ground-based instruments, they don't have any means of absolute calibrating it. It's not like an X-ray instrument where you have a fixed line, no calibration possible. You have to rely on Monte Carlo techniques and you live with an atmosphere which changes all the time. So I allow for like five to 10% variations of the energy scale of the instruments with respect to each other. And so this scale factor here can be determined quite accurately as a way of cross calibrating. And you see how dramatically you improve the chi-square. Like here, for example, Veritas data, you get from 470 chi-square to nine, but just scaling it to the, to the to, to a value which is 5% uh, different. So very sensitive. And you also see here this different overlay of the different seed photon fields, which are, uh, which are doing the job here. So I probably have to be uh, coming to my conclusion or to, my, to, to the end of my talk. Um, here's just a comparison again with the traditional model of pulsar wind nebula, where you have very low pressure in the magnetic field. So very small magnetic field energy density versus the uh, particle energy density. And you reach equipartition then only a large distance from the shock. Whereas in our model now, we basically are dominated by the energy density, the B field, that's the red line. And we uh, are going below uh, the energy density of the electrons uh, at some distance, like three or four uh, shock radii. And then you see that at the outer part of the, of the uh, nebula, they start to go together again to reach roughly the partition again. So the implications of this magnetic field model that we got here is that um, one of the standing problems of this uh, pulsar wind nebula model of Kennel Coroniti had always been, how do you get from the magnetosphere of the pulsar where you're dominated magnetic fields 
to a completely kinetically energy dominated wind at the termination shock. You need reconnection, but how do you do reconnection in this kind of flow? Impossible. Nobody has been able to come up with a solution to this from the theory side. Now it seems that the data actually tells us it's magnetically dominated. So kinetic energy is not dominating at the shock. It's a weak magnetohydrodynamic shock instead. And that's interesting because that solves actually the sigma problem because we don't need any fast reconnection out of thin air essentially. Um, what has to happen though, is you have to still slow down the flow. And that means you need to have maybe some excitation of small scale magnetic field turbulence and uh, maybe dissipation also in terms of acceleration of particles. That's uh, very interesting because that has been discussed in a, a literature uh, uh, quite a lot. An observational consequence, which is interesting, is that if you have this turbulence building up, you expect that the um, polarization in X-rays would be rather small in line with already available measurements from way back. But in, in, more, in, in the upcoming data um, with polarization, I think that's gonna be an interesting point to look into very closely. And there's an interesting thing about the high velocity uh, deviation uh, already in, in this paper by Mori, where they looked at the X-ray Chandra data and especially the, uh, the contrast between the uh, advancing and receding part of the flow, uh, they already concluded that the flow speed is too high. So that's in line with what we see here with a more magnetohydrodynamic shock. From the theory side, this is not completely un, unexpected because in Porth et al, which did for the first time 3D MHD, you see that the pure toroidal field model is not really expected to be. You see that there's lots of uh, other components and actually also some degree of turbulence already present there. And Tanaka et al modeled that explicitly and they also put in that there's some fast dissipation where you basically dump magnetic field energy. Uh, so you excite here the, hydro, the, the, uh, the turbulent part of this uh, and then you basically lose the energy density through dissipation. They assume something like a 10 years time scale. And that would be very much in line with what we observe. I will skip the part about the PV excess here for a moment. Just wanna highlight maybe one additional thing here. That is that if you look at this over the whole 20 years in which we observed the source, you know that X-ray variability is there. So this is the light curve of the X-ray flux in the hard X-rays observed up to now. And the observations that we're using sort of are spread out over the whole time scale. And if you break it up, you realize that actually uh, data sets which are taken at a higher flux than, for example, the lasso data, which plays an important role here, you actually find a different value of the alpha. You find a value which is like all like 0.29. So that means that maybe the whole wind structure can be changing over the time. And that's important because we can trace that through uh, the observations we do here. So I come to my conclusion. I just have here my summary and my outlook on it. I think I mentioned everything here and thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Hans. So we have time for a very quick question. So we will begin from the, uh, the uh, audience here. So uh, please, uh, if you have any questions. What's uh, the status of the possible models for the variability, particularly the X-ray energy? The, the gamma rays have been talked about for quite some time, but I haven't realized that the X-ray flux has changed by 10% or something you had in that time. Seems very large. Uh, yeah, those peaks. Oh, a few percent, I guess. But... Yeah, it's a few percent, yeah. Anybody? any models for what could be doing this? No, I, I think there's essentially no, no straightforward yeah. explanation for this. Um, I, I believe that you could argue maybe this is related to some of also the features that we see dynamically evolving, like these kind of wisp structures which move through the X-ray um, nebula when you look at this with Chandra. But um, I don't think that the, the timescales would match as a matter of fact. Um, and it's it's to me it's completely unclear as a matter where that comes from i mean as i was saying if if the b field structure changes really through dissipation processes then this is actually probably naturally something you expect because why should the thing always settle for exactly the same kind of values over the time um, oh, i hope i got you, i hope i got the whole question because there was a little bit difficult uh, difficulties uh, uh, hearing you Quick question. Um, quick question. Uh, if you 
genetic particle acceleration. Um, what is the most possible mechanism for accelerating particle dissection? The shock, the shock is a strongly dependable shock. So it's not that it's very high back to gamma factor, you cannot accelerate the electron. So is it possible, for example, regression downstream? Uh, Okay, again, I have to I have to take a little bit of a guesswork here what the question was, but I think you're asking about the acceleration processes that could happen in the, in the uh, and, and look could also lead for the dissipation. This is something which has been discussed by um, several authors actually. Uh, Tanaka is one of them. There's a paper where they actually discuss about the possibility that the small scale turbulence that you create would then lead to sort of Fermi type Fermi type Fermi two type acceleration, and that could solve and the problem of accelerating the radio electrons because as you know radio electrons have a very strange spectrum of 1.5 which you cannot get through shock acceleration the wind electrons they are sort of having a spectrum which at least in a feasible range that you could say it's it maybe relativistic shock acceleration like 2.3 when you inject them and then you cool them radiatively and then you end up with a 3.3 but the wind uh, so 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 you could sort of take a, take a share between acceleration at the shock which would lead the wind electrons and energize those and you could have the radio electrons Accelerated further, further downstream, essentially through through reconnection processes. Thank you, Thank you Professor Hans. So I think uh, uh, we we can go more uh, more high to the next speaker. So. Uh,